In late January 2019, the body of a three-year-old boy was found in a sewage pond near Gore. The pathologist ruled death by drowning, no suspicious circumstances. A second police investigation reached similar conclusions. Then two weeks ago, this. The most senior Southern police officer has ordered a review of the investigation into the death of Gore toddler Lachlan Jones. Superintendent Paul Basham admits some steps were missed by officers. He's requested Detective Superintendent Daryl Sweeney of National Investigations to review the investigation. The cause and circumstances of Lachlan's death remain with the coroner. The police have also referred the matter to the Independent Police Conduct Authority. And just last week, in a significant step, the coroner ordered an inquest. The three obvious things that may have happened, that was an accident and he was placed there, there was foul play and he was placed there or he walked out there. I'm Sharon Brett Kelly. Today on The Detail, the mystery of Lockie Jones's death and why a top US forensic detective has been called in. A three-year-old little boy who was found deceased in a sewage pond and nobody knows how he got there and nobody knows what happened? Oh, honey, that's a case. You've got my attention. Melanie Reed and Bonnie Sumner from Newsroom's investigations team have made a nine-episode podcast called The Boy in the Water and published videos and stories as part of a years-long investigation. So, Mel, can you tell me... What happened on that night in January 2019? What what happened that is not disputed? Um, well, what is not disputed is difficult to uh, explain because everything in this case now seems to be disputed. What is not disputed, Sharon, is that Lockie Jones's body was found that uh, night in late January 2019. And he was found at 11.15 p.m. uh, face up in the second sewage oxidation pond in the outskirts of Gore. And the police did an investigation. And what did they find? What was the finding in that first investigation? I don't think the police really did an investigation. I think that they came to a conclusion, which is that uh, three-and-a-half-year-old Lockie left his house. He went missing around about nine, that he walked 1.2 k's from his house to the second oxidation pond, fell in and drowned. So when did you get involved? I got involved about a year or so later, and I... I was receiving a lot of phone calls from uh, Lockie's father, Paul Jones. I was up in Auckland and he was ringing me probably once a week. And, like, I have quite a few people that ring me quite a lot and are quite persistent, but he was more persistent than most. And he just didn't really let up, actually. And I was down south because my family are all down there. So I thought, look, I'll just go and see what's actually going on with this case. I had quite a lot of information on it by this point. But I was sort of uh, neither here nor there. And when I went there and I did the walk from where Lockie was living with his mum and half brother and then to the ponds where he was found I, I it all just it was just like well this something feels really wrong here it's a bitterly cold gray day but it isn't just the cold that's sending shivers down my spine i wonder how a little boy could have walked all this way on his own it was such a long way it was such a long way plus there were all these other elements in that he didn't have marks on his feet, how could he have gone on his way through all these prickles, etc., with no marks on his feet. And then the more I sort of started to get involved, the more it didn't stack up. Um, I just sort of got worse and worse, really, about what hadn't happened, what the police hadn't done in this uh, case. Just as a bit of background here, Lockie's parents were not living together. Lockie was living with his mother, who has name suppression, and has declined to speak to Mel for her investigation. 
She's given a statement to the police detailing how he disappeared the night that he died. But it is Lockie's father, Paul, and his friend, Karen Maguire, who doggedly pushed for answers. Yes, they were very adamant about aspects of it that just didn't stack up. Close my eyes at night and I still see him and that, but um, I'm positive, 100%, I know my son and my heart and the way I brought him up and treated him and that, there's no way he would have walked out here on his own, not unattended. And So nothing will ever convince you? Never. He didn't walk out here. But just too many doubts. And like anybody who feels like uh, there hasn't been a, a, a proper investigation or that there's all these unanswered questions, people can fight, in my experience, very long and very hard if they can't get some sort of answer to the questions that don't seem to be being answered. So in this case, why did he have no marks on his feet if he'd walked all that way through gravel, over embankments, prickles, all sorts of kind of rough terrain. Why were there no marks on his feet? So that was the first thing. But then when we started to look into the case, we could establish a few things, like that the police had not secured the scene. So that means that they hadn't cordoned it off. Well, most people know that even in a traffic accident this happens. There was no scene examination. So therefore there was no fingerprinting or anything done of the of the area. Um, he was sent to the wrong pathologist. He was sent to a general pathologist, not a forensic pathologist. The witness statements weren't taken until a month after Lockie's death, and they took so long to request a lot of um, information. Cell phone data, for example, was now unavailable. So there was this sort of system failure, if you like, after system failure. Reid says after their first story broke in newsroom in late 2020, the police launched a new investigation. Now, it was following our story, but there was a bit of pressure on from all angles. So they investigation, and that reinvestigation was completed at the end of 2021, which basically didn't come up with anything different initial investigation, so there was no one culpable. They still didn't know how uh, Lockie had got out there. And so that was, the reinvestigation was now done and dusted. And so it was after that, we thought, look, we're just going to have another look through this file, because we had quite an extensive file. We had all the pathology reports. And that was when we found that the initial pathologist had written in his autopsy that Lockie's lungs were, and I quote, unremarkable. So Bonnie Sumner and I sort of looked at each other and said, how can his lungs be unremarkable if he's drowned? To the sort of untrained eye, that just didn't seem possible. So what we actually eventually ended up doing is, is doing a bit more work on that, and then we engaged the forensic group here in Christchurch, and we, we managed to get um, Lockie's body sample slides and send them to an independent forensic pathologist in the UK. Here's forensic scientist Dr Anna Sandiford. She sent images of tissue sample slides and relevant documentation to UK forensic pathologist Dr Alexander Kolar, who specialises in investigating suspicious deaths. Essentially, Dr Kolar is saying that there isn't enough information from the post-mortem um, that was done originally to support the diagnosis of drowning that's been provided. So he's saying that there's, there's not the medical pathological evidence to support a diagnosis of drowning. Yes, and the main reason for that is because the original post-mortem was not conducted by a forensic pathologist. His report was extensive, but in short, he said there was not sufficient pathological evidence to support a diagnosis of drowning, and that you couldn't uh, rule out a third party, and that Lockheed's lung weight um, had not been elevated. So his his lungs hadn't been waterlogged. Mm. So you've spent a long time on this. You've collected an incredible amount of information, including witness statements. One, how did you get all this information? And, and by then, how much of this did you know? 
Uh, I, I had all the police files right from the get-go. And so they had all the statements in them that the police had taken with the witnesses. And the problem with it, Sharon, was that they were incomplete. So there was all of these questions that you would obviously ask that hadn't been asked. Um, and then that was when we were able to ascertain that the witnesses had not been interviewed for like a month after Lockyer had died, mm. which is very odd. What became very clear, and it might sound sort of arrogant of me to say this because I'm a journalist, but this was a really substandard investigation. The investigation by the police was abysmal. Paul Jones, Lockie's father, and his friend Karen Maguire, they're pretty outspoken, aren't they? I am worn down. It's been a lot of stress and anxiety and fighting. And So tell me what... We tell Paul about the findings from the UK pathologist. Uh, it's more like I told you so. We've now got the proof that there's no proof that my son drowned. So what happened to my son? Here's Karen Maguire. It's not the be or end all this. The police file. The police file. We know that. They're the experts though, aren't they? Well, do you know in this country? Well, they just call it how they see it. Um, how can I put it? They're, they're very authentic, if you like. It's not like half of the people that we interview these days have been media trained and they all talk about drilling down and circling back and reaching out and... At the end, you know, everyone starts to feel like they've come out of a tin can. Now, when you go down there, you ask them a question and they answer it, and and you might not like the answer, and they might swear or they might, and and they're they're quite amusing too. Karen Maguire's quite um quite an interesting turn of phrase sometimes. I dispute the fact. How did he get out of the house? And Detective Harvey didn't want a bar of it. He just looked at me and said, obviously through the door. What a load of crap. Show detective, me how we could... Detective Harvey did the reinvestigation. Yeah, show me how he got out the show me how he got out the door. That would be basic policing, wouldn't it? We know he couldn't reach the door handle. We know the door jammed. How did he open the door and how did he get out of the house? It's a simple question, Detective Harvey. But they are very relatable. They're straight up. They're raw and they're real with no pretense. And um, they just call it um, how they see it. And you can understand that Paul, it's, it feels like it's taken over his life. But his friend, Karen, she seems as driven to get a, a, the right sort of resolution to this as he is. I think that they're, they're good friends and... Karen Maguire's partner is very good friends with Paul as well. I think Karen has always been quite concerned because she she thinks that she should have stepped in earlier, perhaps before uh, Lockie died, because Paul was always worried about him. Paul was always worried about Lockie. And Karen has definitely said, you know, we, we kind of looked sort of a bit over it and sort of ignored it. And then suddenly he was he, he, he was found dead and we thought, oh, my gosh, we should have listened to him. But I found it a lot in cases in my career where things don't add up and stack up, add up, make sense and there's no answers. People who are determined, like, you know, of, of a determined personality, like Karen Maguire, they don't stop, they don't give up until they get some type of or some form of peace, I suppose. And to, to have some peace, they need some answers and they've spent years trying to get them and they still haven't got them. And this is a common situation when an investigation is not done from the outset, you know, in a full and proper manner. And we spend years as a country uh, paying for reinvestigations, new court cases, because investigations weren't done correctly in the first place. And I, I'm referring or thinking of the Bain case. I remember, because I was there, that the pathologist was sitting outside 
And if the pathologist had gone in straight away and done core body temperature tests to ascertain what time people have died, we, we might not have been fighting or this might not have been a debate for decades and mm. decades because the right policing would have been done at the time. And while we all make mistakes and nobody's perfect, that I think there was just across the board, you know, system failure, if you like, to quote, you know, the detective from America that's been brought in on this case, then I think that there is a real issue here. And speaking of the US detective, Karen Smith was engaged by Paul Jones to look at the police's two investigations and supply that analysis to the coroner. Here's her take on the police work. I'll be very forthright and say that a lot of mistakes were made. I think that a lot of things have been overlooked and I think that a lot of things, a lot of conclusions were were hasty. When you do an investigation of any kind, it involves investigating. That means digging, searching, asking, questioning, um, you know, proving. You know, the, the vast majority of that is missing here. And that, that's a huge problem. So, yeah. It wasn't what I would call a thorough investigation. It wasn't an investigation at all. It was an immediate conclusion. She's no slug, and she has spent a lot of time on this case, and she's very experienced. I think she's had like 300 homicides under her belt, and um, she's uh, pretty phenomenal. But she's really um, held back with what she said to us because the case is in front of the coroner. Mm. And she's been instructed that she can't talk about the reinvestigation of the case. Yeah, and that that's quite interesting about Karen Smith in that she knows stuff that the rest of us don't know because she has access to the coroner's information, the, the second police investigation, the details. Yeah, she's got everything. Fascinating. Oh, it's fascinating, all right. And interesting, too, that she's involved. So that, that sort of really put the cat amongst the pigeons, so to speak, because I think that there is a real fear, um, warranted or not, that the police investigating themselves is not really going to result in anything other than what they found way back when. <laughs> and, you know, there's, there's quite a lot of um, examples of that in, in, the, in the history of, the, of big cases in New Zealand, you know, like the Peter Ellis case that you and I have spoken about before. I mean, that was, you know, an invest- it was a, a conviction and a number of appeals uh, that actually confirmed the convictions and, and nothing ever changed for like 30 years. And so there, there's a kind of history of that. So I think that, especially in in this case in Gore, it's kind of pretty wild that they've gone right. We don't believe anymore that the police can actually reinvestigate this case. So we're going to try and find someone totally outside of the country that can come in and uh, and look at it. And that's what they've done with Karen Smith. And she certainly has not come down on the side of the police. It pisses me off. I'll tell you, the emotion is coming from anger and frustration because can I just be be really blunt? Sure. Nobody with authority gave enough of a shit to find out what really happened. Well, I'm going to. Come hell or high water, I'm going to find out what happened to that little boy. What, What is the next step then, Mel? Well, look, I think that people need to be seriously and properly interviewed. And the people that weren't interviewed and still haven't been interviewed need to be interviewed. That's the first step. There are a lot of people who were around at that time, were there that night, who have not been even spoken to. So that that's kind of like the first thing, I think, because if the coroner did call an inquest, that is like another, it's like a formal hearing. So people can be called and can be cross-examined. And so what we've got in this case is like all the statements are here in a nice little file. No one's, you know, I mean, I, I think in the reinvestigation 
that they've gone back to people. I mean, I've actually spoken to people who say to me that they, the police just came along and said, hey, here's your statement. Do you want to change anything? Now, I mean, if that's the case, we're really in trouble. And so it, that's, that's probably the starting point, right? How have the police responded to it? Well, the police in these situations sort of specialise in not responding. So it does feel like often when we do these big cases that they that they hide behind the Coroner's Act. So Lockie Jones's case is now with the coroner who's the determined cause of death. And the police always say, well, we can't speak because it's at the coroner. So we've had to be quite persistent uh, about saying, look, we aren't asking you about cause of death. We are asking you, why wasn't the scene secured? Why did you not do any forensic examinations at the scene? Why did it take so long to interview people, etc., etc.? And the coroner's formal court hearing is set down for three weeks in Invercargill. That's it for today. I'm Sharon Brett Kelly. The detail is supported by the Public Interest Journalism Fund. Today's episode was engineered by Phil Benge. Our producers are Alexia Russell and Bonnie Harrison. And thanks to Newsroom's Mel Reid. Mā te wā.